Hello and welcome to our webinar series, Stories from the Archives. Every few months we explore the stories behind the treasures and unique family history artifacts found in the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections and the archives at the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at American Ancestors. Today we will look at just some of the many diaries that we have in our collections. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming. I will be your moderator for today's program. Uh, American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I do want to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to your home with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and we thank you for your patience. Patients. If we were to lose connection, uh, not to worry, you will still have access to a full recording of this presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. And this, pro uh, this program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. So our presenter today is Stephanie Call, Associate Director of Archives and Education at the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. Stephanie has been with the JHC since 2007 and is responsible for overseeing uh, their archival collections, creating educational programming and content, and conducting outreach. She earned a BA in English and Jewish Studies from Mount Holyoke College and an, M an MS in Library and Information science with a concentration in archives management from Simmons College. She is a member of the Society of American Archivists and the New England Archivists. So today we'll examine several diaries from our collections. We'll, uh, we'll hear the stories behind these items and the families who donated them. We'll also f discuss how to find relevant diaries in historical societies, university archives, genealogical societies, and other cultural organizations. And finally, we sh we'll share a few tips on handling and preserving diaries uh, that you may have in your own family archives. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is no handout for this session, but as I noted, uh, we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you'll be able to watch a recording of this presentation on our website and on our YouTube channel. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Stephanie. Hello, everyone, and thanks for being here today to talk about one of my favorite formats, the diary. Many of you may have kept a diary when you were younger, or you might keep one now, but for archivists, historians, and genealogists, diaries can be remarkable historical finds, illuminating personalities, events, and everyday life in surprising and familiar ways. Diaries are in no way a Western invention. There are early records of diaries in Japan, India, and China. Western diaries were more likely influenced by those from Rome and Greece. Diaries, which we also call journals, or sometimes you'll see them listed as account books, are seen in larger numbers starting during the Renaissance, and the trend continues to grow from there. The increase in diary keeping is likely connected to the increase in literacy. Particularly among the English, diaries could be spiritual in nature with a focus on one's devotion, but there was also a growing self-awareness amongst people who, as they began to read others' accounts of the world, realized that they too could write their own accounts of what they saw and experienced in the world around them. Early diaries were generally written by educated men who wrote about business or farming. One early well-known diarist was Samuel Pepys, who lived from 1633 to 1703, and he kept a diary for 10 years documenting his life and eyewitness accounts of historic events during this period. This is an evolution from the previous style of diary writing, and we continue to see the diary evolve into a record of events, family life, and daily activities. Archives can have a wide variety of diaries in their collections, ranging from bound books to unbound pages of paper. Mostly they're handwritten, but they can also be typed. Diary types range from pocket diaries to five-year diaries, and blank books were also often used for diaries. 
They can be records of a person's life from the mundane day-to-day -day experiences to their inner thoughts and feelings. In some diaries from the mid 1800s, the books were also used to track spending and were designed to be very, used in a very practical way. And how we think of diaries now and how many of us may keep them now as repositories for our personal feelings and self-examination is a much later development in the history of, these, um, of this format. However, any diary where the diarist has an opinion on an event or a person reminds us of how these accounts can be subjective and not objective, as many firsthand accounts are, like oral history interviews and correspondence. Most diaries are also not written for an audience. They're written for the diarist alone. And so there can be some privacy and ethical concerns when using diaries, particularly the ones that are more recent. There are no easy answers to those questions, but just something I want folks to keep in mind if you're using diaries in your research. So why would historians or genealogists want to use diaries in their research? For genealogists, diaries can add historical context to genealogical research. For historians and genealog genealogists alike, diaries can contain eyewitness accounts to history as it happens. Now, a couple of additional notes on these two bullet points. First, it's important to realize that you don't need diaries from your own ancestors to necessarily provide the historical context you're looking for. If you had an ancestor who was a farmer in the late 1700s in Western Massachusetts, a contemporary diary from another farmer in the same location would provide you with some useful context of what it may have been like for your ancestor, even if they didn't leave anything behind. As eyewitnesses to history, we get to see what an event looked like to someone living through it. And on the flip side, we might wonder what their silence means if they don't write about something that very likely impacted them. And thinking about your own experiences over this past year, how many regular journal writers were able to write about the pandemic as it unfolded around you? And how many of you just couldn't bring yourselves to do it? Many diarists also, quote, spill the tea. In other words, they gossip or just share intel on their neighbors, friends, and other family members in the pages of their diaries. So this is another example of how your ancestor might not have left behind a diary, but their next door neighbor did, and she might have written about your ancestor. Or in diaries that also double as a log of business transactions. Perhaps your farmer ancestor is logged in someone else's diary as a business transaction. Don't disregard a diary because it wasn't written by your ancestor. If there are some commonalities of place and time, you might find your ancestor there anyway. But what diaries also do, and I think to some extent this is the most important point, they promote understanding and empathy. They remind us that we're not all that far removed from people who lived 200 years ago. As an example, I was really just delighted to read excerpts from Betsy Jennings, Jennings Nixon's diary, where as a young girl, she writes about Jane Eyre and how she longs to find someone like Mr. Rochester, someone who was dark and brooding, as opposed to the boy she does end up marrying, who's about as far from Rochester as you can get. In that moment, I connected to Betsy in a very real way. I too had been caught up with the character of Rochester when I read Jane Eyre, 142 years after Betsy wrote about him in her diary. In that moment, Betsy became very real to me. And of course, she was real. But I found a way to connect with her and understand her world better. In some ways, she was not all that different from me. OK, so today I'm going to talk about diaries that we have at the New England Historic Genealogical Society in both the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections and the archives of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. These diaries range from the late 18th century to the late 20th century, and they're written by farmers, students, a ship captain's wife, upper class women, a soldier in the Civil War, travelers, and a rabbi. The diaries that are listed in red here are those from our Stanton Avery Special Collections, and the ones that are listed in black are from the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. Although these are the diaries that I'll be talking about today, Special Collections has over 850 volumes of diaries that span four centuries. The oldest diary in their collection is from 1635. 
Subjects covered in the diaries include military service, farming, and the recording of vital records. The localities of the diaries span from Massachusetts to the Azores, and writers include women, ministers, soldiers, farmers, merchants, teachers, sailors, and even gold miners. Diaries from the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center include those from soldiers, rabbis, students, women, and lawyers, and tell us about the mundane nature of military guard duty, traveling around the world, and the musings of hospital chaplains and college students. The earliest diary is from the 1860s and the latest, the 1980s. As we go through this presentation, I'll share brief stories about the diarists and what these diaries tell us about their lives and where applicable, showcase how these diaries could be used for historical or genealogical research. So this diary here is from uh, Special Collections from John Bliss. Bliss was a farmer from Brimfield, Massachusetts, and he kept this diary from 1799 to 1804 when he was killed in a plow accident. The diary focuses on his activities as a farmer, but also includes some pencil sketches of various buildings, uh, mostly unidentified, but probably buildings on his farm. Blitz doesn't write daily. There are several gaps of months or days between entries, and the entries are fairly short and succinct. Despite his brevity, Bliss does mention people by name, often both first and last names. For example, we do see entries pertaining to a Mr. Hezekiah Fair and Rebecca Miller. He also likes to use exclamation points, which I found a little surprising because I was thinking of him as a taciturn New England farmer. But on a day that it snowed, he wrote remarkable indeed with these exclamation points punctuating those words, uh, which just made him seem somewhat excitable. What is also interesting about this diary is that a descendant of Bliss's, A.F. Bridgman, decided to add to the diary by including a genealogy for the Bliss family and a reminiscence about the family, which Bridgman notes is, quote, an account of Grandpa Bliss's life as told to us by Grandma while she was visiting us at Hyde Park in the early part of 1882. From this account, we know that a John Bliss, who was the second generation from Grandpa, owned a farm in the northwest corner of Brimfield and was killed at the age of 35 after falling off a load of hay. However, this diary belonged to a younger John Bliss, who was killed at the age of 29 in a plow accident. After the younger John died, the farm was sold and called the Collins Place up to the 1860s. Bridgman fills in the gaps of John Bliss the Younger's life. As an example, we learn that he was a school teacher in the fall and farmed only during the summer. But this is an interesting example of a diary that is to some extent repurposed by a later family member and where we're able to learn more about the diarist in retrospect from somebody's recollections of him. It's basically a transcript of an oral history that helps to annotate the firsthand diary entries of John Bliss the Younger. And for those of you who would like to read John Bliss's diary and Bridgman's uh, addendum, it is digitized and available in our digital library and archives. Temple Cutler's travel diary focuses on a short period of time, 10 days from April 4th to April 14th, 1825, or so we've been told. Cutler details his travel from Hamilton, Massachusetts to Marietta, Ohio by stagecoach, steamship, and horseback. Of note are Temple's recordings of a visit by the Marquis de Lafayette to Wheeling, uh, which of course is now in West Virginia, as well as Temple's visits with a number of settlers in Ohio, many originally from New England. The visit of Lafayette to Wheeling is an indication that Temple's dates are off. I'm not really sure why he dated his travels for April, but Lafayette visited Wheeling in May, so the diary is about one month off. Temple was the fourth son and youngest child of Reverend Manasseh and Mary Balch Cutler. He married Sophia Brown of Hamilton, Massachusetts on October 7, 1804, and she died in 1822. He later married Hannah Smith in 1823. Reverend Cutler, Temple's father, helped form the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which came out of the Ohio Company that worked to establish and settle townships on company lands. Temple continued his father's work in Ohio, and this diary recording is probably what may have been his final trip to the area. 
This diary, although short and written within a very contained time period, does quite a bit to illustrate life and travel in the 19th century US. We learn about his route from Salem to Boston, through various towns in Rhode Island, a stopover in New York City, and then onward to Philadelphia and Baltimore. In Baltimore, Temple writes rather excitedly of a robbery committed the evening before his arrival, which I'll share. He writes, a gentleman traveling to Baltimore on horseback was attacked by a man on foot with a gun who robbed of $170 and a watch. All the neighborhood were out to search. When we came to the spot where the robbery was committed, which was a wood and a thicket, our leaders took a shear on which we stopped to see what should be the occasion, but could discover nothing. The colonel and myself agreed to stick by each other and fight it out if occasion should require, but we saw nothing of any robbers. I personally think he sounds a little disappointed. Temple's diary, once he arrives in Marietta, includes quite a bit of name dropping that's a veritable who's who of New England family history. For Monday the 16th, Temple writes, introduced to Colonel Barber, member of Congress from this district, introduced to Colonel Stone, a wealthy trader in groceries, likewise to Captain Dodge, formerly of Wenham, a very sociable old gentleman, he and his son Dudley, wealthy tanners, introduced to Dr. Hildreth, a son of Dr. Hildreth, formerly of Haverhill. And the names continue, Putnam, Ward, Cheever, where he provides some detail of how he was introduced and briefly what he thought of each person he met. So although this is a relatively, again, short time period that he's writing about, and this very unassuming board book style diary, Temple has allowed the reader to see what Ohio was like in the early 1800s, as settled mostly by his fellow New Englanders. And as we know now, this part of Ohio is very much like New England with similar place names and architectural stylings. This diary does give us a glimpse of the earlier days of this area, as well as how much it's grown, even from Temple's earlier visit, as he remarks while traveling to Amesville. This land is very generally settled on this road, though when I was here 1809, there were only two houses on the whole road to Ames. Our next selection of diaries were written by Dedemiah Born Swift. Born on April 23rd, 1812 in East Falmouth, Massachusetts, Dedemiah married Hallett Swift on May 14th, 1833. The couple continued to live in East Falmouth until her husband, who was the captain of a whaling ship, died on May 26th, 1849. In 1853, she moved to Benton County, Indiana, and later to Des Moines, Iowa in 1864. Dedemiah and Hallett had four children, including Lucy Swift Curl and Alfonso Swift, the only child of hers to outlive her. Dedemiah also did not want her sons to go out to sea like their father, but she lost one son in the Civil War. She never remarried and in her later years attended women's suffrage meetings. And her obituary had this fantastic line that she, quote, was a woman of persistent purpose in her ideas and opinions. Dita Maya writes of her husband's trips on his whaling vessel, wondering how long it will be before he returns. And in one entry she writes, husband has again taken his leave, he says, for the last voyage, but alas, it may terminate the voyage of life. How uncertain is everything on earth? How many strange occurrences will transpire before he is permitted to return? We know not. She can go quite a bit of time before writing or in between her entries, they're not very consistent. Her earlier diaries include long paragraphs, but she later switches to pocket diaries, uh, which we'll see in the next slide. So here we have her pocket diary, and I hope that everyone can see that the original pencil is still with this diary, which I, I just love. Uh, archivists really do love their pencils. Uh, here we can see she's not writing daily. We have an entry for December 8th, 1851, followed by presumably January 4th, 1852, and January 19th of that year. On the 4th, she writes of the very prosaic activity of going to the dentist and getting fillings in two of her teeth, but she also writes of social visits with family and friends, whom are listed by name to some extent. We have a Mrs. William Robinson, and on the 4th, there are two Robinsons mentioned with their first names as well. And here we have the last two diaries in this collection, and I'm basically showing these just to demonstrate how diaries are changing over time. Uh, she starts out with a very slim marbled cover booklet, essentially, upgrades to this commercially available pocket diary, 
and then moves on to this leather bound uh, blank book. And then her last diary is really a very simple, probably hand stitched collection of folded over blank pages. So it's proof that it doesn't matter what your diary looks like, it's what you write in it. Dita Maya died on July 23rd, 1888 at the home of her son Alfonso and his wife, Emmeline Carl Swift in Des Moines, Iowa. This diary here is from Martha Ann Kuhn, a young pupil who studied at Bronson Alcott's Experimental Temple School in Boston from June 1835 through November 1837. Bronson Alcott, of course, was the father of famous author Louisa May Alcott, and his short-lived school focused on the Socratic method of teaching. Alcott believed that students and teachers should be engaged in a dialogue and that students held the answers to their questions within them. Some of these conversations were published in a book called Conversations with Children on the Gospels. Martha's diary mentions a conversation about Jesus healing a withered hand that makes an appearance in the second volume of that book. Martha's diary records many of the activities at the school in 1836, but the later part focuses more on a summer trip taken with her family and an account of a Shaker worship service in New York. The daughter of George Horatio Kuhn and Mar Martha Tufts Frost Kuhn, Martha married Samuel Greeley Clark in 1857 and had two children, George and Martha Anna. The diary was donated to NEHGS in 1954 by her granddaughter, Eleanor Clark Bowser. This diary is a firsthand account of the lessons and experiences of a young student in school. Martha either draws or writes of drawing, maps of the Wisconsin Territory, Northwest Territory, Kentucky, and Tennessee. In one entry, she writes, in school, I took my seat and wrote my journal till 10. We had prepared and had a conversation, which was very interesting. After recess, Mr. A wrote from Pilgrim's, read from Pilgrim's Progress. We then went home. I did not come to school this afternoon as two of my friends were at our house. However, my favorite line from Martha's diary is from a July entry where she writes, please excuse mistakes, whoever reads my journal. We know that this diary was written primarily for schoolwork, but it's interesting to see Martha's cognizance that someone will be reading her diary at some point. Although Martha's diary is from the perspective of a nine-year-old girl, her diary could be quite useful for historians, in particular, those who are interested in Bronson Alcott School or education history. It's also, kind of a fascinating look at how geography was taught of um, geography in the US in the 1830s. Martha's diary is also digitized and you can read it online in our digital library and archives. And other diaries of hers are at the Fruitlands Museum and the Boston Athenaeum. Betsy Jennings Nixon was born on February 11th, 1839 to William Nixon and Louise Sheldon Nixon from Marietta, Ohio. And her diary was written between the ages of 14 and 27 and includes commentary on her daily routine, school, church activities, social visits, and her courtship and eventual marriage to Milo Wilson, not Rochester of Mercer, Pennsylvania on March 31st, 1857. When Milo served in the 148th Regiment, Ohio, during the Civil War, Betsy documents her struggles of running the family farm in his absence. Betsy's, um, and as I mentioned earlier, Betsy's diary is the one where she compares Milo to Rochester and Jane Eyre. In the 1880s, Betsy and Milo moved to Del Norte, Colorado to be closer to their two sons, William and Zebulon. And at some point, someone did type up a transcript of her diary. I'm not sure who, uh, but it has been very useful uh, as it does provide some easier reading. One thing we see as we read through this diary is the trajectory of a young woman from a teenager who comes across as a bit flighty to a woman with quite a bit of grit. This diary gives us some wonderful insight into the perspective of women during this time period, particularly during the Civil War. In this entry from August 1864, Betsy writes, Although I never did such a thing before, I planted my own corn. It happened the ground was ready before the guards were called out. And I write a little for Cincinnati Gazette as I have time, so I suppose I shall get on. But how I do have to work. Oh, that this war was over and my own good man at home. The separation is dreadful for us. 
Zebby is the cutest baby we have ever had. He was down on all fours eating grass as he pretended. I said, why are you doing that, baby? Jeehaw, he says, meaning he was a horse. He mimics everything the rest do, no matter what. I am so different from the other women. When they get together, they are all crying bitterly, but my eyes are dry as dust. And just a note that although transcriptions are 99.9% .9 helpful, they can have errors. Handwriting may be difficult to read or there could be stains, foxing or faded ink. A lot of that you can see in this image here. Um, and that can obscure some words. So even the best transcriptionist might be forced to make an educated guess sometimes. And this diary uh, is also digitized and you can find it in our digital library and archives. My colleague Scott Stewart has written about this woman's diary, Hedwiga Regina Schober Gray, for many years now on the blog Vita Brevis. Born in 1818 in Philadelphia, Mrs. Gray lived in Boston in the Beacon Hill area and wrote about her family, household, and events that unfolded around her between the years 1860 to 1884. The diary begins when Mrs. Gray's children are young, between the ages of three and 13, and end a year before her death in 1885. Mrs. Gray is one of those tea spillers that I mentioned earlier in this webinar. She likes to write about the people in her circle, and she has some strong opinions. As Scott shares in one post, over the course of many years, she notes Eliza Winthrop's father's habit of marrying wealthy women, 22nd of October, 1865, and she worries that the Peabody's are too prone to marry their cousins, 11th of November, 1884. She writes tartly that Senator and Mrs. Charles Sumner, who parted soon after their marriage, are each to blame for the failure of their union, both of them too selfish and flighty to sustain a relationship, 19th of January and 23rd of February, 1868. And Scott also shares that Mrs. Gray writes of his own ancestor, his great-great-uncle William Pratt Lyman, whom she remembers as a small boy and in this entry notes that the Harvard senior has grown into quite a handsome young man. So this is a nice example of how your ancestor might pop up in a diary that belongs to someone entirely not related to you. So here's an example of some of the work Scott has done with this diary. Um, so this particular post is about the playwright Oscar Wilde and how he's received in Boston. And there's a disdainful entry from our diarist about Wilde's lecture at Harvard, where she makes it clear she disapproves of the student's behavior, writing, he bore with dignity and self-possession the mocking display and aesthetic dress of sunflowers and lilies by 60 Harvard students at his lecture. The young men made no disturbance, but their very presence in such guise was a tacit insult. So again, you can read more of Scott's work with Mrs. Gray's diary on Vita Brevis, and there's a link there to that particular post. Our first diary from the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center archives is this small pocket-sized commercially made diary written by Adolphus Strassmann, our Civil War soldier. Born in Hungary when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian -Hungar Empire, Adolphus immigrated to the U.S. with his family on July 7, 1857. They settled in Fall River, Massachusetts. Adolphus enrolled in the Union Army on November 23, 1863. Correspondence from his family indicates that Adolphus lied about his age in order to join the Army and receive the government bounty for completion of service, in order to help his family financially. He served as private in the 2nd Regiment of the Massachusetts Volunteer Heavy Artillery, Company I. Adolphus is a succinct writer. He mostly wrote about being on guard duty, but he does write about where he is on guard duty, Fort Rowan, Fort Dalton, and Kinston in North Carolina, and Camp Chattanooga. He also writes a bit more than usual about the Battle of Wise Fork or Southwest Creek in Kinston for March 7th to 10th, 1865. This is when General Braxton Breck's Confederate forces blocked Major General Jacob D. Cox's Union troops from the Burn Goldsboro, Goldsboro Railroad, which cut off supplies to General Sherman's troops. But perhaps my favorite entry of Adolphus is when he goes on a molasses raid. Despite his brevity, the number of days marked with on guard duty tell us about the more mundane aspects of the Civil War, interspersed with the movement of troops. We don't know how he felt or what he thought of the war he was fighting in. Those innermost thoughts are nowhere to be found on these pages. 
Adolphus was discharged from the army on September 3rd, 1865 in Fayetteville and returned to Boston with his government bounty. And this is a digitized diary as well. Charles K. Davis was born in Cincinnati, Ohio to Adolph Davis and Johanna B. Summerfield. Charles founded the cigar company A. Davis Sons and Company named for his father and brothers. In 1882, Charles traveled to southwestern Kansas with Leo Wise to aid in the establishment of the Beersheba Colony. The Beersheba Colony was sponsored by Cincinnati's Hebrew Union Agricultural Society to establish Jews immigrating from Russia. During this time, Charles kept a diary that would eventually be published in 1965 by the American Jewish Archives. Charles married Ida Fletcher and they had two children, Ella and John. Ella married Nathan Isaacs, a lawyer and Harvard professor, and the family settled in the Boston area, which is how we have this diary here. Written in 1903, this diary documents the world tour that Charles took, which according to this newspaper clipping, would start in San Francisco before going on to Hawaii, the Philippines, Sumatra, Java, China, Korea, India, Arabia, Persia, and the Holy Land. And then he would go on to Australia and Europe before heading home. It was quite the travel endeavor, and Charles's diary entries can be somewhat brief, as they are here from Osaka, where he just throws out some facts and figures. But it's an interesting journey through a number of places, seen from the perspective of an affluent American. Edith Rachesky was a daughter of Samuel and Julia Schumann. Samuel was the owner of A. Schumann & Company, a wholesale clothing company or store. Originally from Germany, Samuel married the Massachusetts-born Julia. Edith was born on December 23, 1873, and was one of four daughters. And uh, the couple, or I should say Julia and Samuel, also had two sons as well. On February 19, 1894, Edith married businessman and politician Abraham Captain, or Cap Rocheski. The wedding was attended by 500 guests, including then Governor of Massachusetts, Frederick Greenhalgh, and members of the 1893 State Senate. The wedding was quite the lavish event and was written up by the Boston Daily Globe as an event of brilliance and importance. Not much is known about Edith, other than she was a steadfast second to Cap in his endeavors, and she served on the board of directors of the Boston chapter of the American Red Cross and the Country Week Association for Underprivileged Girls in Beverly. Cap often gave his wife credit for their philanthropic gifts, of which there were several. This travel diary was written in 1911 and details the Rocheski's journey to Malta, Constantinople, and Jerusalem. Edith writes mostly of the sights seen and what they did, so in this essence, it feels very much your typical travel diary. But within its pages, we get a feel for how an American woman experiences these cities during a time that's very different and yet similar to how we might experiencing, experience them today. As she writes from Constantinople, that the effect of the city from the Bosphorus is very beautiful. The many minerals of the many mosques making a picture against the sky. We first visited the St. Sophia Mosque, the largest in the world. And this diary has also been digitized and can be viewed in our digital archive. Leon Obermeyer was born on September 24th, 1886 in Illinois. In 1894, he moved to Philadelphia with his family and later attended UPenn as an undergraduate and for law school. In 1908, he joined the firm of Mason and Edmonds. In 1925, this firm changed its name to Edmonds, Obermeyer, and Redman, and the firm still exists today as Obermeyer, Redman, Maxwell, and Hippel. Leon married Julia Sinsheimer on May 24, 1923, and they had three children, Herman, Helen, and Arthur, and we have this collection courtesy of Leon's son, Arthur. This is an example of a diary that's not in a bound volume. It's written on a pad of paper, uh, what was called a, a writing tablet, the original writing tablet in 1913, and documented an ocean trip to Panama when Leon was 27 years old. And this, this entry is somewhat amusing because Leon is sort of waxing philosophical about why one keeps a diary and what's important to share. 
And he writes, a diary, I assume, because every diary is different from every other one, should first contain an accurate record of one's happenings and interesting incidents and people, then possibly one's impressions and comments, and then less possibly one's thoughts. The latter are more, are more often too transitory, changeable, and private. And Leon does follow his own advice, beginning his diary with this very uh, illustrative paragraph. On July 27th, 1913, he writes, it is now about 24 hours since we arrived in New York City and the wheel of fate and fortune has moved with a marvelous rapidity in that short time. I am lazily reclining in the steamer chair after a very pleasant conversation with Miss Pauline Bitter of Kingston, Jamaica on earthquakes, women's suffrage and feminine modesty. All about is the deep and dark blue of the ocean and nearby are the waves from the ship with their caps breaking over their heights and floating away in this spray. I wish I knew what Miss Pauline Bitter thought of that conversation, quite frankly. One example of a very inconsistent sparse diarist is Sarah Friedman, who was born on December 20th, 1913 to Joseph and Lena Friedman. She received her BA in social work and a master of social services, both from Simmons College. Sarah worked as a social worker for many years and helped resettle displaced persons after World War II. This five-year diary was a gift from her brother Jacob and was written in periodically between 1931 and 1932. And I include this diary with the infrequent and often brief musings on Sarah's daily activities as an example of what I think many of us might have in our own personal collections of diaries. Sarah wasn't really interested in delving into topics and we get the sense as from her June 4th, 1932 entry, where she says, I suppose I did some studying, I don't remember, that she isn't actually writing on the day itself. She's going back to try to fill in some blanks. So this is used as an example of a diary, diary where perhaps the diarist is not that forthcoming, not that interested, and that's okay. What we still learn from Sarah is that 18 year olds were perhaps too busy and too interested in living life to write in their diaries. This five year diary is by Norman Alanock, who wrote between 1948 and 1952. An employee of the Four River Shipyard, he wrote about his work in the shipyard, local events, and Boston sports. He also gives the weather report frequently. And Norman keeps up with his five year diary. So for those of you don't, who don't really know how a five year diary works like this, um, they can be a little tricky when you first look at them. Um, the diaries have a page per date, so December 21st has a page, and then on that page there are a few lines broken down by year. So you would write in the diary from left page to right page, continuing to turn the page per day, and then you'd go back to the beginning and start on page one for the new year. So hopefully you can see how that works um, here in this picture. But what's really great about Norman's diary is that his son Bruce transcribed it. And he didn't just transcribe it, he annotated the entries, and in some cases included photographs of the people his father mentions in the diary. So this was an incredible labor of love um, and an amazing product that resulted from this work. So here we see entries in February, and the last entry on February 22nd, 1949 is the one that I'll call your attention to. Norman writes, kind of cold and rainy, no work today. Don't feel good coming down with cold. Margaret Johnson spent afternoon and evening with us. Big explo explosion Boston shook house. Bruce annotates the entry with text from a newspaper article on a blast in Canton at the Rockland Fireworks Company. So in this one entry, we have a full name of someone known to the family, Margaret Johnson, and historical information about this fireworks company explosion. Here's another example of an annotation that helps with historical content. On June 7th, 1951, when Norman writes, sunny but cool and tonight cold, our rays passed the yard. The Constitution left at 3 p.m. Anniversary gift came from Mrs. Thomas, very nice. In this entry, we have some labor history about the Shipyard Builders Union and how the Constitution, a ship built for American export lines, and famously, this is the ship from the movie An Affair to Remember, is delivered to Boston Harbor early because of a possible strike at the shipyard. 
And just one last annotation example in this entry, Norman writes, nice and warm but cold tonight, up to Mike's this afternoon, over to Bill's and Anna's, took pictures with my new flash, hope they're good, Bruce went to Sunday school. And under this text, we have the photographs that Norman took and the people identified in the photograph. So again, this diary and the annotated version of it by Bruce Alanak provides a great example of how even the pithiest of diarists can provide a wealth of historic, historical and genealogical information. And our last diary example is from Rabbi David Alpert, who was born in Boston in 1900. A graduate of Boston University College of Liberal Arts, Harvard Divinity School, and the Jewish Institute of Religion, Alpert was the first Boston-born rabbi and the youngest to be appointed to his own congregation. After serving in World War I at the age of 24, Alpert was appointed rabbi of Congregation Beth HaShalom in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. By the 1930s, he was living in the Boston area again, and he was involved in Jewish chaplaincy at local hospitals, mental health institutions, and in 1947, the State Department. And among those institutions served by Alpert were Boston City Hospital, Jewish Memorial Hospital, and the state hospital, hospitals and institutions um, in a wide variety of towns. Rabbi Alpert and his wife, Jeanette, had a son, Frank, who donated these diaries. There are several diaries in this collection dated between 1946 and 1981, so they span quite a bit of time. Alpert was also very good at recycling, so most of his standard diaries, which were published for specific years, don't actually align with the year they're published for. So as you can see here, he has written 1956 on the cover of a diary that was published for the year 1941. He does date his entries, so there's never too much question about the actual dates that he's writing. And this is another example of some of what we see in these diaries. Often there are pieces of paper that are just stapled to blank pages of the diary. Alpert's diaries are a mix of events, his work as a hospital chaplain, his thoughts on political issues of the day, and also his feelings and struggles with being a hospital chaplain, as he often felt that he was looked down upon by his fellow rabbis and congregations. And lest you think I forgot about mentioning those privacy issues, Alpert had mixed feelings about what should happen to his diaries upon his death. In one diary, there's a note to his son that his diary should either be destroyed or donated to Hebrew Union College. Obviously, neither of those things happened. Um, however, these diaries do include a number of reflections on chaplaincy work and current political events of the time, and I do think that they're an untapped source for historians. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about locating and using diaries in your research. And I'll talk first about locating diaries here at NEHGS and the JHC and then other places. So at NEHGS and the JHC, you can use uh, three different tools to find diaries. The first is the library catalog, the second are finding aids, and the third is our digital library and archives for those that have been digitized. You can find the library catalog at library.nehgs.org. To locate diaries and special collections, you can select the advanced tab and search, type in diaries in the search field and for collections, select manuscripts. And this will bring up any collection that lists diaries as a subject in the catalog record. And you can of course also search for diary or journal. Um, so your search will bring up a variety of diaries that are available in manuscripts. If a diary has been digitized, there will be an icon that says website. And if you click on this icon, it will take you to the digitized version and the digital library and archives. That same search can be used for diaries, diary, or journals for the Jewish Heritage Center collections. The caveat here is that uh, for the search screen, we're listed as our old name the American Jewish Historical Society. Hopefully that will change soon. You of course can do a global search as well and search through all the collections to get the largest number of results. Um, you'll also come up with published diaries in addition to the original unpublished diaries that are in the two archival repositories. And here we have that list from the Jewish Heritage Center holdings. On the screen, you see that website icon again. Um, and this is where we do things a little bit differently than special collections. Instead of being brought to the digitized item, you will be brought to the online finding aid for that collection. 
So just something to keep in mind if you're using the catalog. And this is what the Jewish Heritage Center's online finding aid repository looks like. So here you can also do a search. Um, you can search the archives for diaries, and that will, of course, bring up anything that has diaries listed as a subject. So when you get your list of results, and you see I've talked about diaries from each of these collections today, um, and there are further search facets along the right-hand side of your screen. So when you select a collection, as I did with the Abraham Rocheski papers, you'll see how the collection is broken into subtopics or series. And you can see what's in each series box and folder. And here we have series two or subseries two, I should say, diaries and other books. Um, so that's how you would find them there. And here is the URL for a digital library and archive. The DLA contains collections from the Jewish Heritage Center, Special Collections, and the Research Library. And if you scroll down on the homepage of the DLA, you will see entry points to each online repository, but you can also browse by format. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about how to use the DLA today. My colleague Sally Benny did a webinar a few months ago, so I encourage everyone to check that out um, if you would like to know more. So when you select formats, you're brought to the next page and you see all those formats listed, including diaries. Um, and that will bring up all the diaries that have been digitized and are available in the uh, digital archive. And also just a note on finding aids for special collections, you can locate them in this digital archive as well. So that's just a quick tutorial on how to find diaries in special collections or the Jewish Heritage Center archives. And so how would you find them elsewhere? Best place to start is online. If you're looking at an archive or library, doing a quick search in their online catalog, particularly if you know they have original materials in their holdings, is a good place to start. There are also online discovery services like Archive Grid and SNAC, which stands for Social Networks and Archival Context. These are essentially large-scale online databases of archival finding aids from a wide number of repositories. The catch here is that an archive has to actively participate in this database project, and they need to have online finding aids. But these are useful search engines for finding aids because it allows you to search across multiple archives for people, places, subjects, dates, and formats. So it's a little bit like one-stop shopping. Of course, digital archives are another place to look. In many cases, a good search engine uh, search can bring you directly to a digitized item. But if an archive has a digital archive, it will be linked on their website. All archives do things a little bit differently. So if you spend time in our digital archive, you'll see that special collections in the JHC present materials very differently. The best way to get to know a digital archive is to read any FAQs or how to search or how to use pages that the archive makes available. The Digital Public Library of America and more local versions of the DPLA like Digital Commonwealth, which is what we have here in Massachusetts, are also really great resources for materials. And these sites are free and very easy to use. And finally, finding aids for archival collections are excellent resources. They are like maps to collections and they'll readily identify for users if they're diaries or journals in a collection. Finding aids tell you more information about a person or family and it can give you additional context for the collection. Although archives have been making strides towards creating finding aids that are similar from one repository to another, you will see differences in how they create these finding aids online. So for some, you might have a PDF online, and for others, it might look more similar to what you saw with the Jewish Heritage Center's finding aids. So just to do a couple quick examples in archive grid, um, a search for diaries. Uh, which you put in the search box, and I also searched for Jewish. Uh, this is a good example of reading instructions because Archive Grid is specific about the use of quotes around your search phrases. So as you see, I got 1,530 results, and the top two results are from two university archives. So I selected the Benjamin Bridge Papers, and that brings me to the finding aid for this collection at University of Washington Special, or Special Collections. 
And another neat feature with Archive Grid is that you can look at results as a list view, like we were just doing, or you can look at it in a summary view. And when you look at summary view, you get this grid of people, groups, places, topics, archives, and locations that the search is pulling from. So if you only wanted to look at diaries that were local to you, you could select, you know, as an example, United States, Massachusetts, Cambridge, and only finding aids from archives in Cambridge would come up. Here's another example on Archives Grid of searching for diaries, um, farming and the 19th century. Uh, I'm just showing these two results and we see that they're personal papers that are in one instance also located at a university archive. And so this is where I just wanna make the point that um, I think many genealogists only think to look at archives at historical societies or library special collections, but universities and colleges have really excellent archives um, and they shouldn't be overlooked because they're on college campuses. They, they do, of course, focus on papers of alums and faculty, but depending on their collection policies, many do have collections pertaining to a wide variety of topics and groups. So the big tip is that although we live in this very digital age, it's important to remember that not everything is online. Digitizing materials is expensive and it takes a lot of time and staffing that many places don't have. In cases where you're looking at a smaller historical society that might not list their holdings online, but mention that they have diaries and an overall description of their resources, you do need to call or email them with some specifics about what you're looking for. Staff have a good handle on what's in their collections and they're always happy to help guide your research as needed. So if you have diaries as part of your personal collections and you want to ensure their longevity, there are a few steps you can take for at-home preservation. Uh, if you have access to a scanner or you're able to pay for an outside vendor to digitize the diary, I do recommend doing this so you have a use copy. This is particularly useful if the diary is very old or fragile, but also if you want to embark on a transcription project, you might find that the digitized copy is a little more helpful to zoom in on um, and you'll also be handling it less. So that's important if it's older or fragile. If it's a newer diary, then you don't necessarily need to limit handling. You can also order custom sized archival boxes that are asset free from places like Gaylord or Hollinger Metal Edge. Two popular types of books for uh, boxes for books are the drop spine box or clamshell. Boxes for books do need to be similar uh, in size to the book, not much larger than the book itself. Um, you wanna be able to place it safely in the box and keep it stored away from sunlight and in a place where temperature and relative humidity is stable. And I just beg of you not to store your items in attics, basements, or garages. And finally, when you open the books, you want to cradle them gently so you don't break the binding, unless of course uh, they already can lie flat, as many of them probably can. If you have a fragile diary or one where the binding is coming apart or issues with mold, anything that you don't wanna try and handle on your own, you can find a conservator that's local to you by visiting the American Institute for Conservation's website at www.culturalheritage.org. And that is all I have for you today. And I think I will toss it back to Ginevra. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. It was great to see what excerpts and stories you pulled from these diaries. They were um, really fun and engaging and you can definitely, I could even start to feel empathy for the writers even through those excerpts. So thank you so much. Um, before we get to your questions, um, just to kind of continue this theme of stories and storytelling, I do want to tell you about a few upcoming programs that you are all invited to. Um, the three that I'll mention today are all free, um, but of course you can find our full um, upcoming events on uh, our full listing at AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash online hyphen classes. So next Wednesday, May 12th, uh, best-selling author Daniel James Brown will discuss his newest book, Facing the Mountain, A True Story story of Japanese American heroes in World War II, which portrays the kaleidoscopic journey of four Japanese American families and their sons. One demonstrated his courage as a resistor. The three others volunteered for the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and displayed fierce courage on the battlefields of France, Germany, and Italy. Certainly a program not to be missed. 
Um, then on May 21st, curators Nancy Carlisle and Peter Trippi of Historic New England will share the stories behind some of their most intriguing paintings and portraits. And on May 27th, Lindsay Murphy will present on how to use the collections of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center in your family history research. So certainly, uh, Stephanie talked about some of the diaries from the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center archives, um, but this will take a deeper look at some of the other materials held there and how they can be helpful in your research. All right, so let's get to some of your questions. Uh, go ahead and type your query into the question panel and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, so first of all, Toby asks, do you have any advice for transcribing diaries where the ink has faded and or the pages are damaged? And I know you suggested um, making a digital copy, um, but any advice on how to transcribe, especially when the ink is faded? That is a really good question. I think um, you might want to talk to a conservator uh, who specializes certainly in ink and paper, which um, I, I think sometimes there, there are some tools that I'm not aware of or special uh, ways to digitize something that might be able to help bring some of that um, that ink out a little bit uh, digitally, not, not literally on the paper. Um, but I think sometimes it's just an educated guess. Um, you saw on Betsy Jennings Nixon, that first page of her diary, which is pretty much ripped in half. Um, and I think that a lot of what the transcription is of is just trying to guess where some of those missing words are. Um, so I would first talk to a, a conservator, somebody who specializes and see if there's some way of digitally pulling that out. And uh, Rebecca asks, so if the handbound diary won't lie flat, how can it be digitized? So there are um, book scanners that are specially created to, to cradle a book to digitize um, the pages and not break the binding. Um, Barbara asks if you could just mention that um, resource, I think it was your final slide on um, finding a conservator. Uh, the URL again? Yes. Is that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's www.culturalheritage.org and it's the American Institute for Conservation. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, another question. Uh, Toby asks, could you highlight some of the sources um, that one would use to provide historical t context for these diaries? So thinking about uh, the example that you showed that was transcribed and all of those annotations, um, what are some of the sources that you might use to kind of um, bring to light some of what's written in those diaries? So uh, newspapers are a great source. Um, a lot of newspapers have been digitized uh, and are available via databases through public libraries. So I would certainly start with newspapers from, um, from that time um, or any sort of news account. Um, you can also look at other primary source materials that are contemporary to that time period of the diary. And I think, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this annotation would certainly be easier with uh, more recent, um, more recent diaries, you know, it might be harder to do with a diary from the 1700s, but I would certainly start by looking at what is available during that time period for the diary um, to find other mentions of an event happening um, and definitely starting with newspapers or if there are some sort of oral history interviews or um, other sort of oral history type materials that are available, um, those will always be helpful. Um, and Barbara asks about um, what are, where can you find some of the archival storage materials that you mentioned? Uh, so two places that I usually recommend are Hollinger, Metal Edge, that's one company, and Gaylord. Those are um, both good companies. You can go online. They, they're they good companies with not so great websites, quite frankly. They're a little challenging to get around, but they will have a wide variety of materials on their websites. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Rebecca asks, uh, do you know if the Smithsonian if they have a diary collection? 
Uh, that's a really good question. I would assume they have diaries, but um, I did not look. So that's a really good question. I'm sure if you go to um, their website and see what's available, they will let you know. Um, and just a question about donating diaries. Um, I mean, how do you kind of start to look for what repository might want a diary? Um, you know, do places only take diaries from famous people or uh, what what kind of suggestions do you do you have if someone is interested in donating a diary? Uh, so to answer the famous people one, um, not at all. I, I think that diaries of sort of your average everyday person are are far more interesting for people and, and certainly far more interesting for historians in, in a lot of ways. Um, so I would start with either a local historical society or if the diary is uh, in response to a particular event or time period, um, you know, if there's a museum or an archive that focuses on that. Um, I think that sort of aiming for a geographic archive is is a good place to start. So if it's the diary of someone who lived in Burlington, Vermont in you know, the 1800s, I would start with archives that are in Burlington, Vermont first and um, move out from there. And archivists will always give you additional recommendations. So if they can't take the diary or it doesn't fall within their collection policies, they'll give you at least two or three other places to contact. All right. Well, thank you. That looks like um, just about all the time we have for questions. And I think we were able to answer most of the questions that came through. If for, you know, as you watch this again, or maybe you start to think about um, items in your own collection or how to find diaries, if you have questions, you can certainly reach out to us. Um, but you can also um, chat with a genealogist if you have specific questions about your research. This is a, a free program. It's open to the public. You can learn more and actually start using the service uh, by going to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. You'll be put in touch with a real life genealogist who can answer your question and help. And uh, this service is available Monday through Saturday, nine to five Eastern time. And another thing, uh, before closing today, uh, we'd love to hear your stories and maybe receive some images of the diaries that you have in your own collection. Um, and we'll share those with others and other uh, members and other friends on our social media platform with your permission. And if you're interested in sharing some of the stories and items that you have in your collection with us, um, you can send us a picture and a description or maybe some excerpts like Stephanie did and uh, send it to stories at AmericanAncestors.org. And I'll include that information as well as some of the other key information from today's presentation in a follow-up email uh, later today once that recording is posted. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs programs for you and for others. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.